All right, so this chapter is all about invertebrates, and I'm just going to caution you now, there are a lot of them, so I apologize for the length of this video. Um, invertebrates don't have backbones. They account for um, approximately 95% of the animal species that we know about today, and to say they are morpho morphologically diverse would be an understatement. Um, you can see some examples of some of the invertebrates that we're going to talk about in the picture below. And so these are all examples of our invertebrates. Um, the first invertebrate we're going to talk about are sponges, and they actually are kind of more of an out group um, because they are the one invertebrate that does not have true tissues or organs. Um, they are um, part of the phylum Periphera. Um, they tend to be found in in aquatic environments, they are suspension feeders. Basically, food has to move past them um, in the water that they are immersed in for them to be able to get their um, nutritional needs. And then water gets drawn out through the spongial cell um, through an opening called the osculum. Fun stuff. And so there's an example of a sponge um, actually in the ocean and a sponge um, looking at it anatomically. Um, a little bit more about sponges. Um, they have choanocytes, they're flagellated color cells that get that water current going so that they're able to ingest their food. And they have amoebocytes as well that help them digest their food um, and provide structure. They are hermaphrodites, they function as both males and females. Um, every, pretty much any other animal that's an invertebrate is going to, well, whether it's invertebrate or vertebrate, it's going to belong to the clad eumetazoa, animals that actually have true tissues. And the first um, phylum we're going to talk about in that clad, one of the oldest, is the nadarians. Um, there are all sorts of forms of nadarians. They can either be stationary, sessile, or they can be in motion, motile. And they include your jellies, your corals, and your hydras. They're pretty simple. They have a diploblastic radial body plan. And their basic body plan is just a sac that has a central digestive compartment called the gastrovascular cavity. And because of the one opening, that functions as both their mouth and their anus. So two major forms of this body plan, either you have the stationary polyp or you have the motile medusa. Um, the polyp attaches to the substrate. Um, by the aboral end, and the medusa, which is more of a bell-shaped body, um, doesn't attach, is able to move. And so those are the two uh, examples of the Darian body plants. Um, they are carnivores. They have tentacles that allow them to capture um, their prey. Um, the tentacles have nidocytes on them, which um, are able to help them defend against um, potential intruders and be able to capture um, their prey. Uh, nematocysts um, are located within, within the nidocytes and they um, send out stingers, uh, singing threads, pretty well. And those are four classes of nidarians, hydrozoa, scyphozoa, cubozoa, and an anthozoa. Okay, so that's looking at it um, on an, an anatomic level. Hydrosomes can vary between the two forms. Um, hydras, which are found in fresh water, exist only in the polyp form and they reproduce by budding asexually. And there's their life cycle. The scyphozoas, the jellies, uh, the medusa form are the more prevalent form that we see of those. If you've ever been to the ocean, you know sometimes there'll be a jelly outbreak and you'll see a whole bunch of them on the sand. Okay, the cubozoa, the box jellies, and the sea wops. You can see what they're named for in terms of box. Their jelly shape is more of a box like. They have complex eyes, and their nidocytes are definitely not ones you want to run into. Okay, anthocytes, um, sorry, anthozoans are the corals and the sea anemones. They exist as polyps. They tend to form symbiosis with algae, and they have um, a hard external skeleton. Lophotrochozoans. Um, this clad is not going to appear like there's a whole lot of relationships, but because they are identified in this clad by their molecular data, so they have a wide range of body forms. 
Um, they tend to be bilaterian animals with bilateral symmetry and tripoblastic development. Most have a psyllum and a digestive tract that has two openings, and we can see um, that they are part of the bilateria clad, along with the ectozoa and the deuterostomia. Um, so the lophotrochozoa clad, um, they have kind of, some of them have the lophophore for feeding. We'll see a picture of that. I think we saw it on the last chapter as well. Um, some of them pass through a stage similar to it, larval trochophore, and some of them don't have that at all. Um, examples of animals that are part of this clad include your flatworms, your rotifers, your ectoprox, your brachiopods, your mollusk, and your annelids. So flatworms tend to be found in some sort of habitat that has water associated with it. Um, they go through tripoblastic development, but they are acelomates. Um, they exchange their gases across their surface, and they use protonephridia to regulate your osmotic balance, um, kind of like we use our um, nephrons with our kidneys. Um, there are two lineages of flatworms. We have the catanolidia, the chainworms that are able to reproduce asexually, and the rabbitophora, which are the ones you're probably more familiar with. Um, they are both free living and they are parasitic. Um, the free living um, rabbitophorians that you're probably most familiar with are the planarians. They tend to live in freshwater habitats and prey on little animals. Um, they have centralized nerve sets, pretty wild. A um, little bit more complex um, than what we see with the nerve nets that we've found in the nadarians in general. They are hermaphrodites, and they can reproduce both sexually or asexually. Um, rather than by budding, they reproduce by fission. Um, so there is an example of one of those. The parasitic ones um, are the trematodes and the tapeworms. Um, Trematones can parasitize all sorts of hosts, and they can alternate between sexual and asexual stages. Um, the ones that parasitize human will tend to live in snail hosts to start with, and then they have surface proteins that mimic their hosts and release molecules that allow it to go after your immune system. Tapeworms are parasites of vertebrates. They do not have a digestive system. They take in nutrients from their host's intestine. The scolex contains suckers and ho hooks so they can attach to the host. The proglottids are um, the units that have their sex organs. They're found behind the scolex. And when their eggs are fertilized via sexual reproduction, they leave the host's body and feces. Yay. Don't go around those. Okay. So there's some examples of that. The rotifers. Um, they are found in environments that have water as well. They are a little bit smaller than protists, but they are multicellular. They have specialized organ systems. They have alimentary canals, separate mouth and anus. Um, they reproduce by parthenogenesis, um, where females are able to produce offspring from unfertilized eggs. Um, and there are some species that don't have males at all. Okay. Um, we said the lophophorates have a lophophore, a crown of ciliated tentacles around their mouth, and they have a true psyllum. There's two phyla, the ectoprocta and the brachiopoda. brachiopoda. Um, the ectoprox are um, stationary colonial animals. They look a lot like plants. They have a hard exoskeleton and they can um, take part in reef building. The brachiopods um, on the surface look like clams and mollusks, um, but their organization is not the same. Um, they are um, found in marine environments, and they attach to the seafloor with a stall. So there's examples of brachiopods and ectoprox. Mollusca, snails, slugs, oysters, clams, octopus, and squids. Most of these are going to be found in marine environments, but you can have some that are found in freshwater and some that are found on land. Um, they tend to be soft-bodied animals protected by a hard shell. Um, they have a similar body plan that consists of three features, a muscular foot, a visceral mass, and a mantle. Um, they have separate sexes. Um, their gonads are located in their visceral mass. The snails um, can are typically found or often found as hermaphrodites. And then they have the life cycle that's got that ciliated larval stage called a trochophore. So there's um, an anatomical breakdown of a mollusk. 
um, some classes of mollusks, the polyplacophora, the gastropoda, the bivalvia, and the cephalopoda. So the first one we're going to look at are chitons. Chitons are oval-shaped marine animals. They have an armor of eight dorsal plates, pretty wild. They use their foot like a suction cup to grip onto things. And their radula is able to scrape algae off of rock surface so they can get their nutritional needs. Um, three quarters of all living species of mollusk are gastropods. Again, they can be found in marine environments or uh, freshwater environments or land environments. Um, the most distinctive characteristic, this one's pretty wild, is torsion, uh, which does not mean what we think it does. Um, it causes the animal's anus and mantle to end up above its head. Um, so it's a little bit different than the shells coiling. Most of them have a single spiraled shell. Um, slugs um, don't have a shell, or if they do, it's very reduced. So that's what we mean by torsion. Bivalves are marine. Um, down in marine habitats, clams, oysters, mussels, scallops. Um, these are the shells I love to get at the beach. Um, after their animals have left them, they're divided into two halves, drawn together by adductor muscles. Um, they have Some of them will have eyes and sensory tentacles. Um, the mantle cavity contains gills, which are used for feeding as well as gas exchange. Cephalopods. These are carnivores. Beak-like jaws surrounded by tentacles of their modified foot. Octopuses um, would fall in this category. Squids. Um, the nautiluses um, are also a group of cephalopods that are shelled. Um, there are very few of the shelled ones that exist today, but these do. They have a closed circulatory system. They have well-developed sense organs, and they do have a complex brain. Um, there were other shelled cephalopods called ammonites, but they went extinct, oh, about 65.5 million years ago in the creation, at the end of the Cretaceous period. Okay. Um, protecting um, freshwater and terrestrial mollusks. A um, lot of mollusks are um, going extinct um, because people want the pearls and the pearl mussels for the freshwater bivalves. And then the terrestrial gastropods, the land snails, why they are going extinct is not just necessarily because of economic reasons, but also due to habitat loss, pollution, and non-native species coming in, and survival of the fittest taking over. So that picture, the, the graph is showing you um, the percentage of extinctions. There's an example of one of the snails that is endangered, and then why they are going extinct, you can see in the picture below. Annelids. Bodies composed of a series of fused rings. They are silomates. Um, we have the polycats, uh, polycatas, or the polycats that are uh, marine um, in origin. They have paddle-like parapodia that allow them to move and work for their gills. And then we have the oligocats, the oligocatas, which are your earthworms. Um, and they are named for their sparse caddies and the bristles that are made of chitin. Earthworms go through the soil, take nutrients out of the soil. Soil moves through their alimentary canal. They are hermaphrodized but can cross-fertilize, and they can reproduce asexually called, um, by a process called fragmentation. Okay, so there's some earthworms. You have fun? Leeches. Um, leeches tend to live in freshwater, but they can live in terrestrial habitats as well as marine habitats. Um, they are um, invertebrate predators. They can suck blood. Um, they have been used for medicinal purposes because they secrete a chemical called hirudin that prevents blood from coagulating. So it can help to like people um, in old times would put leeches on areas of the body that had a lot of blood built up to help to get that blood, uh, the blood levels down. Ectozoans are um, filled with many, many, many species. They are covered with a tough coat called a cuticle, which is shed or molted. Um, and the two phyla that are most commonly discussed with the ectozoans are the nematodes and the arthropods. Nematodes, ramworms, uh, found all over the place. They have an alimentary canal, but do not have a circulatory system. Their reproduction is typically sexual. They um, are able to fertilize internally. 
I looked up how to say that word and now I don't remember it. We always call it C. elegance. Um, sorry about that. Um, it is um, used a lot in research. Um, all of its G um, DNA has been sequenced um, and you would not think that you could use worms to find out a lot of stuff, but let me tell you, they do. Um, there are nematodes that are important parasites. Um, Trichinella spiralis is what happens when you eat um, pork or meats that have not been cooked properly. And there you can see the um, worms that were not killed off as a result of being um, meat not being cooked completely. And then they take over your body. Yay fun. Arthropods. Two out of every three known species of animals are called arthropods. They are found in all habitats of the biosphere. They have a body plan with a segmented body, a hard exoskeleton, and jointed appendages. It goes back to the Cambrian explosion. Um, they show little variation between their segments, especially the early ones. Um, as they have evolved, there has been a reduction in those segments and more of an increase in their appendages being specialized. Um, and it's thought perhaps that the gene changes that have occurred are due to changes either specifically in those sequences of Hox genes or more likely in their regulation. Um, the appendages of the arthropods that exist today have been modified so they're able to walk and feed and sense things, reproduce, defend themselves. Um, the body tends to be covered by the cuticle, which is an exoskeleton made of protein layers and a polysaccharide chitin. Um, as it grows, it molts. They have eyes, they have olfactory receptors, they can smell, and they have antennae um, that help them with both touch and smell. They have an open circulatory system. The hemolyph is circulated into spaces surrounding the tissues and the organs. And then they have organs that are specialized for gas exchange that have evolved over time. So there's an example. Um, arthropod lineages, there's four major lineages that diverged pretty early on in this phylum's evolution. The chelicerates, the myriapods, the hexapods, and the crustaceans. Chelicerates are named for their claw like feeding appendages. Earliest forms were Eurypetids, water scorpions. Most of the marine ones are extinct, um, but one that does still exist today are the horseshoe crabs. Um, for the marine, the modern ones are arachnids. Those would be your spiders, your scorpions, ticks, ugh, and mites. Okay. Arachnids have an abdomen and a cephalothorax, which has six pairs of appendages. Um, there's gas exchange through book lungs, um, which are their respiratory organs, and they are able to produce silk, um, which is a liquid protein from specialized abdominal glands. Myriapods, millipedes, centipedes, they are terrestrial. They have jaw-like mandibles. They eat decaying leaves and plant matter, have lots of legs, two pairs per trunk. They are carnivores. Um, centipedes are, excuse me, are carnivores and have only one pair of legs per trunk segment. Insects. Um, hexapoda. This is the one that contains more species than pretty much all the other living forms combined. They live in pretty much any possible terrestrial habitat and in fresh water. They have complex organ systems. They have diversified um, once flight started to take place with evolution being able to feed on gymnosperms and then angiosperms. Um, it decreased slightly during the Cretaceous period extinction, but has been increasing ever since. Um, flight allows them to be able to escape predators, to be able to get food, to move to new habitats way faster than those that can only crawl. They often undergo metamorphosis. Some of them go through incomplete metamorphosis. Um, most have males and females reproduce sexually. They are able to find each other through their senses. Some can um, benefit as pollinators or others are harmful. And there are over 30 orders of insects. So that's an example of that incomplete metamorphosis they were talking about. Crustaceans have remained primarily in um, water environments, marine and freshwater. Um, they have branched, appendage, branched appendages that are specialized specifically for feeding and locomotion. Um, small ones are able to exchange their gases through the cuticle. Larger ones have gills, and most of these have separate males and females. 
um, isopods or pill bugs. Um, they are found in land, freshwater, and marine species. Um, decapods would include your larger crustaceans. Um, planktonic crustaceans would include your copepods. Uh, and barnacles are often found in are a group of sessile crustaceans. Their cuticle has hardened into a shell. Echinoderms and chordates. Echinoderms are your sea stars and your sea urchins. The chordates are all your vertebrates. That'll be in chapter 34. They make up the clad deuterostomia. Characteristics that are found in that clad are radial cleavage and formation of the anus from the blastophore. Uh, there are other animals that share their similarities, so surprise, surprise, these are defined by their DNA. Um, sea stars and other echinoderms are slow-moving or sessile marine uh, animals. They have a thin epidermis that covers their hard calcareous plates. They have a water vascular system, which is hydraulic canals that branch into two feet that help them to be able to move and eat. Males and females are separate. The reproduction is external. Um, most adult echinoderms have radial symmetry and form multiples of five, and their larvae have bilateral symmetry. So that's kind of neat. Five classes of echinoderms, Asteroidea, Ophiroidea, Echinoidea, Crinoidea, and Holothoroidea. Asteroidea, sea star, sea daisies. They have multiple arms from a central disc. Um, the arms have tube feet, which are allow them to grip the substrate with good old chemistry. They feed on bivalves by prying them open with their tube feet, diverting their stomachs, and digesting their prey externally. They can regrow lost arms. Sea daisies were just recently discovered. They live on submerged wood and absorb nutrients through a membrane that surrounds their body. Um, brittle stars, they have a distinct central disc. They have uh, longer flexible arms, which they allow them to move. Um, they can be suspension feeders. Some are predators, some are scavengers. Sea urchins and sand dollars, they don't have arms, but they have five rows of tube feet. Um, they use their spines to move and protect themselves, and they feed on seaweed with a jaw-like structure on their bottom. Sea lilies and feather stars, they attach to substrates through stalks. Um, some can crawl, the feather stars can crawl with their arms, and they both are suspension feeders. Sea cucumbers, they do not have spines, they don't have as strong of an endoskeleton, and they typically really don't look a whole lot like the echinoderms, but they have five rows of tube feet, and some of those are used for feeding tentacles. Chordates, um, consist of the two subphyla of invertebrates, as well as hagfishes and vertebrates. Um, chordates are bilateral, symmetrical silimates with segmented bodies, and they share a lot of embryonic development features with the echinoderms, but definitely have evolved on their own for the last 500 million years. And we'll spend more time again on them in chapter 34.